space. Now, now what we've really been waiting for. So I'd like to invite the panel members up to the stage, please, up to the Millennium Falcon up here. Uh, firstly, Flavia Tartanardini from Fleet Space. <laughs> come on up, come on up. Second, uh, Adam Gilmore from Gilmore Space. Uh, Andrea Boyd from the European Space Agency. And Jason Held from Sabre Aeronautics. So, thank you very much for coming along. Um, we've really got much of the kind of brains trust of the Australian space industry here. And uh, we're going to, um, firstly, I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves because you're all doing um, different parts of space. And, and really, we were talking before, we could almost launch a rocket here today with all your expertise. Um, so we're going to start, I'm going to show one slide each. Flavia, here we go, wait for it. Oh, God. Tell us a little okay. bit about Fleet and, and, and what this means up here. So Fleet is a, um, a South Australian company that I co-founded with two co-founders. We are about to launch 100 nano satellites that are going to create a digital nervous system all around the world to connect for free all the Internet of Things devices. So we call it 1F. It's our goal to make Earth a better place, but our ambition is bigger. So we want to bring IoT on the moon. It's 2F and on Mars. That's 3F. So we uh, founded a company in 2015, and now we are in Blackbird portfolio, really proud, and uh, try to make this happening if this guy also makes his thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we should say the F stands for fleet, right? The First F fleet. stands for fleet, yes. Second fleet. And third Australians fleet. in the room will get that. <laughs> um, OK. Exactly. Adam, tell us a little bit about how we're going to get these satellites into space. OK, so we're developing a satellite launch vehicle um, with uh, an engine technology called Hybrids, which has been around for about 50 years, but has had a critical stumbling path that prevented it, and we think we've solved the problem. Um, you know, our philosophy is um, designed for cost, small teams, powerful teams, um, test as we go. Um, we're hoping to launch in 2020 our first satellite. Um, we're based in Queensland and in Singapore. And I think we're your latest acquisition because it's only a few days old. We, you, you are absolutely our latest investment. Okay. <laughs> and next is uh, Andrea. Yeah, I work at Mission Control for the International Space Station. Um, so that's my PlayStation 7. I need all the screens. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm the voice that you hear talking back to space when the astronauts call Earth. So you're the only one that's allowed to speak to the astronauts, is that right? Or the uh, main my conduit? Is the only one in Europe, yeah. Wow. Awesome. Uh, Jason, tell us a little bit about Sabre Astronautics. Astronautics, yeah. All right, Jason Held, Sabre Astronautics. We're making the next generation of mission control software. Uh, a lot of the, 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 the what would you say, the Xbox Angie's working on, uh, a lot of text on a screen, and we're turning it into a video game. So mission operations, so easy your kids can use it. So the reason that we're running the space panel here today is that we want to introduce space to the startup community. It used to be that space cost billions and billions of dollars and was really only the realm of governments. And we've started to see some commercial space companies form, SpaceX being you know, the notable one, uh, perhaps. And I think what's really exciting to us at Blackbird is that space is now something that startups can do. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And maybe, Flavia, you can start telling us how has this changed? Well, why does it not cost billions of dollars and need a government behind it? to do something in space? So for, uh, not, I don't know how much you guys, all of you know about space, but just to give you some idea, a big satellite is, is big. And NBN satellites was something that, you know, is, was probably bigger than this astronaut things that we set up here. It's a billion dollars exercise, a billion dollar money to launch it. It's a very expensive exercise. Really not something for startups, I can promise you. But what happened is the past 20 years, something incredibly changed. You know, with the miniaturization of technologies in US, of course, everything starts in US, they started having this idea that instead of launching in space, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, for example, a, a big satellite that can launch a storm of B using 3D printing, in, in manufacturing, uh, all kind of microtech to bring space a little bit smaller and affordable, moving from what we call geostationary to very close to Earth. So what it means is that the, the market is now ready for startups. And uh, Fleet raised 75K 
<laughs> to launch, you know, the first satellites and all our tech. And now we got this five million. We're going to launch the first satellites of the constellation and have global coverage. So it's it's big number. It's different number for billion of dollars, right? Um, tech's innovation innovation changes so much. Space was always used for very very complicated things, and now we can use it for everything. So you have to check companies like Planet, Terrabella, uh, they are really doing amazing, amazing things. Just Google it, okay? These are companies with $100 million can create global coverage for everything. And the technologies, they just are, for us, are there. And we are grabbing them. And, you know, I've heard today about, you know, getting things together and, you know, buy all components, assemble them, put them in a satellite and launch them. It's, it's easy. <laughs> Sounds really easy. Okay, <laughs> uh, isn't it? A little bit. Adam, it's not rocket science. It's easier. <laughs> yeah, we use the term rocket science a lot, Adam. And now Adam is here. So how? Uh, tell us. Tell us what it means to be a rocket scientist nowadays, and and how do you get, you know, rocket engines to take things to space? Well, I, I think um, the education of universities out there is much better than it was, and we've been able to hire people that have you know, hands-on experience in making hybrid rocket engines and testing them and seeing all the pitfalls. Um, and then you, you build the rocket in a, by components, a lot like a satellite. You've got your engines, your fuel tanks, your outer shell, your avionics bay, your payload, and you can you know, use like system engineering to put it all together. And so we, like all rocket companies, start with the engine, because the engine is the most important thing in the rocket. The yeah. engine is the rocket itself. Yeah, if you don't have that, then you're going nowhere. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. Um, and then, so we're spending the rest of this year developing a big rocket engine that will be big enough to take stuff to space. Uh, and then we'll fly our first rocket at the, or second rocket at the end of the year, but step by step, learning along the way. And I believe that is a way to prove technology cheaply rather than doing a full up test and putting $10 million on the line like Elon Musk did, or he put 20. Every time he launched the rocket, he spent 20 million on the rocket and failed three times. We don't have 60 million to blow, so we're looking at it from a different perspective. We'll get there in the end, but much cheaper. Great, great. Andrea, you're the one person here with a real job, <laughs> all, these, all these startup founders. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about a day in your life, you know, what it is. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mission Control, I'll sign on in the morning. Usually I take the morning shifts. Um, I'll sign on or talk to my counterparts in the other Mission Controls around the world. It's not just Houston like the movies. There's five Mission Controls for the International Space Station. So there's Houston, Huntsville, Munich, Moscow, Scuba. So I'll chat to my counterparts. Um, and then we do the first call all together to the astronauts to kickstart this 12-hour science chock-a-block work day. Um, and then it's just running science stuff uh, with the astronauts all day um, and chatting to different different... You Russian or American or European or Japanese uh, astronauts and yeah, it's more or less my day. Do you, do you get to chat or uh, uh, share Don't gossip usually or is chat it or is it space strict to ground? It's time. pretty. Uh, we'll chuck in a few jokes every now and again, but <laughs> it's uh, you know when you're when you're being listened to by all the other mission controls and broadcast on the internet and anybody can pull you up on UStream or archive.org in five minutes later. You, have, you be a little bit careful what you say. If they want, anyway, they've got an IP phone on board, so they can just call any phone on Earth. So if we want to be a bit more blunt, they'll call me on the phone, and then we're much more <laughs> honest. Jason, we, um, you know, tell us a little bit about um, Australia and its place in the, in the global space um, industry. We haven't done too much to date. It seems that we, we've had some radio stations on, on ground and there's yeah. been, you know, that's obviously great and there's been quite a lot of publicity about the radio stations but there hasn't been too much else. Well, what's been happening in Australia and, and why is that about to change and why can we do it from Australia? Well, I, the, the, I mean, historically Australia has been very strong academically but not strong at all uh, commercially. And part of the reason why is, is you know, the Americans and the Europeans are very competitive about building products that Australians buy. So we actually, if, if you look at the, at, at, at the, the, the government sizes, we have a, um, a uh, market of, of three to five billion a year, but when you dig through the layers, it's actually an expenditure. So, wait, so, so Australia spends three to five billion three dollars, to five billion dollars a, year a year on space. Stuff. Projects, yeah? stuff, uh, regardless, yep. and sometimes it's a bit higher. Like we get an MBN coast satellite or something like that, or yep. or an Optus satellite. You still kind of count that, um, and and that's been that way for for a while. Just because you have to launch in order for people to buy your stuff, all right. So a lot of Australian startups just didn't bother trying to do space because 
you know, the, the barriers were so high previously. Um, but the, what's changed is just the market's changed, right? You reduce the size of the satellite, like Flavia said, you're reducing the cost from a $2 billion satellite to, say, $300,000 per bird for the whole mission, mm. right? So uh, that, that's, uh, I, I like to say, it's about a third the cost of a Boost Juice franchise, yeah. you know? <laughs> so it's, it's bootstrappable, you know, so people are, so we have, um, and this is, this is not a change in, in government or policy, this is strictly groundswell market. We've got more startups in Australia per capita than anywhere else in the world right now. More space startups? Uh, more space startups, thank you. Uh, awesome. it, other than maybe California, um, and, and my, my track I'm seeing, uh, and these are just the ones I hear about, maybe about two per month. Every month I hear about two new startups in Australia that are like, we're gonna do space, we're gonna give it a go. Yep. And a third of them are funded from series A to, to seed. Yep. Uh, which is interesting, um, and uh, another thing which is interesting, it, it accounts for every leg of the thing you need to do to have a space mission. For, you've got launch people, you've got missions, you've got operations, you've got uh, avionics, you know, like these guys, Obola Systems out of Maitland, you're doing avionics that, that are really good, and we just need to kind of band together as a community to kind of get us over that hump. Yeah. Flavia, you... Uh, obviously Italian by birth. Yep. But you moved to Adelaide to start this business. Why Adelaide? Oh, hardly. And the real truth. You could tell it's the truth. It's my husband. Your husband. Yeah, I met my <laughs> husband in Europe and uh, yeah, we're still married. <laughs> when I arrived here it was 2012 and he lied to me. He said, <laughs> I think he's going to see this, going to watch this, right? Oh, good. Yes, he'll be oh watching. Oh my God. <laughs> I love you. Okay. <laughs> He lied to me. He said, and um, most probably was our perception, you know, I, I had this amazing job, you know, I was doing amazing things and, uh, in Europe, in nanosatellites, I got patents, I'm a big nerd. <laughs> and, you know, my idea was I would come to Australia and find a job straight away. Hmm. Adelaide is an engineering hub, a lot of companies, and it would take me three seconds. I was overqualified, I wasn't Australian, it was a nightmare. So the first nine months, I really couldn't find a job, or oh, the job I like, I had to work in mining and, uh, yeah, uh, Andrea <laughs> will tell you a story about it. Um, so for me, my story is something that Mike said before. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I was stuck in a corner, and I loved nanosatellites, and I saw that they were just happening, and it was a commercial product, and it was blowing my mind. And I'm like, we have to do something about it, because I know them. That's my expertise. And I need to contribute to this ecosystem somehow. So I got really stuck in a corner. And that's desperation. Desperation is honestly the fire <laughs> under the rocket, OK? Because then I got to know my co-founder. They're South African, actually. <laughs> Not Australians uh, whatsoever. But it just worked out, <laughs> OK? <laughs> so this is what happened to me. This is why I'm in Adelaide. That's a great story. And Adam, I want to hear a little bit about your transition into the space industry because you were in finance before. Yeah. And, and why space and when did you first start getting interested in space? Well, I've, I, my first interest in space I remember was my dad went to NASA when I was about five and I honestly said to him, Dad, bring me back a rocket. <laughs> and I thought he'd bring me a big one back and he got me a little model. So, you know, that's kind of where it started and then, you know, I became a banker for 20 years but kept watching the industry and then the big critical thing for me was in 2004, there was an X prize that was one, uh, Spaceship One went up to space twice and came back within two weeks. And I thought that was cool, and then I found out they actually had funded the whole thing with $20 million. So, you know, you were talking about billions and billions of dollars, and here was a company that had gone to space twice. Not only that, uh, designed the very high altitude mothership to drop it with jet engines and the whole nine yards, for $20 million, and I thought that is definitely something that I can get involved in, um, and if they can do it, I can do it. And I'll have the benefit of seeing what they've done and seeing their mistakes, and hopefully not doing the same mistakes. So that's when I started getting very serious about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna switch uh, a little bit and talk, uh, talk about some of the applications that we're gonna see in space. And Andrea, I know you, you think quite a lot about space and applications, things we use here on Earth. Tell us a little bit about you know, I think people don't quite understand how uh, important space is to their daily lives, and then a little bit about where it goes in the future. 
Yep. So in Australia, we are completely reliant on space for everything we do every single day. Like 15 of our primary industries are 100% reliant on space and would die in about five seconds without satellites. And most people think, um, especially uh, that you know, space is astronauts and, and going to Mars. Okay, my day job might be astronauts, but that's not what the majority of space is. You're talking about satellite and satellite applications. So it's like GPS, it's a satellite TV, it's a satellite comms for the phones and things for the outback. Um, it's like uh, bushfire monitoring, flood monitoring, border control. Um, Australia's really big. You know, if you take our landmass and our islands and oceans and Antarctica, it's about one-sixth of the Earth. Um, there's no way that you're going to monitor that and look after it, um, except for from space. We need to fly a plane over all of Australia and Antarctica every single day, or have two satellites. Um, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer to have that. And we do rely on, in Australia, so for, for GPS, um, for surf reports, for the weather report, um, mo everything, even you know, position, uh, precision navigation and timing. So all of the finance, banking transactions, every time you use an ATM, that is space. And that's what we're talking about uh, with regards to space. It's a $350 billion a year industry. It grows by about 10 to 14% every single year. Um, and that's increasing uh, annually as well. So it's, it's a massive massive growth industry and has huge applications, especially to us in Australia. Okay, coming back to Australia for a second. Um, there's anyone in the Australian space industry knows that there's kind of moves afoot to, to get things going in Australia and change a few things. And one of them is there is an Australian Space Act and it's, uh, it's quite restrictive. And we're very much hoping that that, uh, it was, it's old, we're very much hoping that that is gonna be rewritten or is, has been redrafted and is going to be um, you know, made law soon. Um, and we're also very much ho hoping that we might get an Australian Space Agency. Um, I know, Jason and Andrea, you've been both you know, quite um, you know, instrumental in, in trying to push this forward. Can you tell us a little bit about why we need a space industry? What a, sorry, a space agency. What exactly a space agency means and is for Australia? Okay. Oh, boy. Uh, look, I mean, first of all, a, a space agency um, the purpose of, of a space agency is to be the action arm, the implementation arm of a nation's space policy. So, so it's to take that currently sort of $3 billion-ish that we spend and actually coordinate how that's spent. That should be one part of it, uh, but it's not necessarily all of it because you have to think in terms of, of you know, uh, strategic goals for the nation and, and political goals for the nation as well. Uh, I mean, I, I think, and, and Angie and I talk about this a lot, uh, that the uh, goal for Australia to have self-sufficiency mm. in space, because the impact of not being self-sufficient is that you have to follow the rules, tactics, and procedures of, of other nations that you might be allied to, but they don't really have Australia's best interests at heart. They have their own interests. Mm -hmm. As long as our interests align with those allies, we're great. But in times which, and, and it ha is happening more and more frequently recently, in times which you diverge, um, certainly commercially it's, it's diverged, uh, talking about the three to five billion dollars a year, but also you know, strategically, militarily, you know, we, we need to have our own capability to manufacture our own satellites because then you own the road mm -hmm. that produces all the data streams that we're talking about. Yeah, and you can actually look at things that you want to look at as well because most of that three to five billion is just purchasing satellite data, satellite images that we use every day, you know, for farming, for precision and agriculture, for automated mining, for whatever, for um, bushfire monitoring, for floods and, and all of that sort of disaster response. Um, and it might just be that, you know, the other countries have satellites that pass over Australia and they're like, oh, we've got pictures, do you want to buy them? So we just buy whatever, we're not even targeting what we particularly want to look at. Yeah. Um, and because it's so discoordinated, we have like 17 different federal governments and uh, departments and agencies buying this data, as well as the state GIS, um, as well as companies and whatever. Sometimes we purchase the same image three to five times at, let's not say how much each, um, it's, it's a lot. And you know, you, you, if, if they suddenly want to change the price of that, we're fully reliant on them and we just have to keep paying whatever they're, they're selling it to us at because we don't have our own satellites. The two NBN and the Optus satellites, yes, they're kind of Australian, but all we did was foot the bill. As Jason said, we're 100% import space economy of this three to five billion. We could easily turn that into a 50% export within five years if we wanted to. Yeah, it, the, yeah. It's every, everything you just said spot on. There's another impact as entrepreneurs. As yeah, founders. our startup is really important. You know how I see, for example, Fleet. And most probably Adam has got the same idea. Is that uh, startups are growing and be backed up, and uh, you know they're going to be more. I hope. And uh, when we need the recognition from the country that says, says we are we are here, we are here. A roadmap, innovation. We are here. We are also going to support you. There's, I mean, um, when when we managed to raise with you guys. 
my happiness was we could stay in Adelaide and we got a satellite facility to operate in Adelaide and we are going to do from there. South Australia is losing a lot of manufacturing, as you probably know. This is advanced manufacturing. It's great. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next year when I, when I uh, raise my Series B? Will they support me? Will they allow me to hire 100 people to deploy, uh, to build 98 satellites in, in my warehouse in Adelaide? And that, that's a key. It's important and it gives recognition. And you can't think so big if a country behind you is not, is not there with you. From, I mean, we are going to raise anywhere, right? We're going to go ahead no matter what. I think it's the ecosystem around you that is critical. I went to US last month and I was, I was thinking, uh, how people are actually looking at us. In Silicon Valley, they love Australia. Australia is an amazing country, okay? And they always ask you the question, how's it going with the space agency? And I'm like, oh, here we are again. I don't want to answer that question anymore. I want people seeing companies to grow and startups and ecosystem growing with a country that is there, with a space agency, with a program, with support. I honestly compete with Silicon Valley European companies, okay? They raised five million before a CUSA for free from NASA, and I didn't, okay? So I'm fighting with them, and they've got a very big advantage. <laughs> and that's, 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 that's how it is, okay? But the beauty of Australia, and I repeat this because I've seen this in my competition in Silicon Valley in the US, this country, we always think that we are not good enough. So every startup is there, try to create the best, and oh, we have to be the best, and we have to do so much. And then you realize that the others don't really do so much, okay? And you're thinking, oh, I'm actually quite good. And the people are amazing. You know, you hire people that stick with you. They love it. They love Australia. Look at Andrea. She came here. She, she works in Europe, Europe, right? She does everything. All my directors abroad are Australian. It, there is this passion for the country. And I think this, the government needs to stand up and say, okay, we are here for you, honestly. Thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic, passionate answer. They're going to hunt me down. Uh, Adam. They know where I live. <laughs> oh, gosh. Adam, let, let, let's, you know, I, I think in the past, the, let's say, sort of old school Australian attempts at, at building a space industry has been a lot about needing government support and <coughs> needing a lot of money and subsidies from, and grants, handouts from the government, and sort of kind of demanding that to get going. But it's completely different now, right? You know, how, do you, how are you going to get funding and do you expect handouts from the government? Or, you know, how do you expect the government to cooperate with you? Well, I mean, I think the, the sea change in a nutshell has been the emergence of small satellites has made the need for a small satellite launch vehicle become apparent. And that's really only about seven years old. And that's where we look at the commercial market and we're looking at all global customers and saying, you know, we can address this need in the absence of any government money. And then, you know, when you guys come in and invest in us, I get confidence that, okay, and you told me if we do the right things, we'll get more money, that the VC community can back us for commercial reasons. We don't need the government. So I started the company with no intention of getting any government money, and I've always told my team, if you know, we can't uh, act like we're going to get it, we just have to go on, on everything else. I do think we should get it. I mean, I agree with what you said. I compete against other rocket companies that get tons and tons of money uh, from their own governments. It sounds as though there's an opportunity, though, for the government when it's thinking about buying space projects or activities to look to the Australian industry now Absolutely. and to back the Australian industry in the same way as the US government backed SpaceX yes. or backs other space sh startups. And we can, we can absolutely do that. So the first NBN satellite, for example, that went up, so you know, every time we need a satellite, Optus, NBN, whatever, we throw you know, two and a bit billion dollars to the US to do it for us. We don't own any of the blueprints, so if anything goes wrong, we've got to pay them again as a variation. Um, and you know, then you pay 900 million to Ariane to launch it, for example. Um, there were two uh, broadband satellites, same size, same capacity, on the first um, Ariane launch that took up NBN1, Skymaster. The uh, other one was done by Argentina, um, fully owned, operated, um, designed, built everything by Argentina um, with their space agency, and they have a fifth of our GDP. I think if Argentina can do it, we can definitely do it. And now, as you know, New Zealand's got a space agency and launched rockets as well, so we can, Australia can but definitely do it. It has to be a two-way street. Yeah. Okay, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I've been in a lot of meetings like this, a lot of think tanks where, where you got you know, a lot of silver hair space. And I'm getting silver hair now. I've been around that long. <laughs> uh, but they sit around in the room and, and, and they spend eight hours a day complaining about the government. 
All right, and this, this is what, what I've been hearing for the last decade and a half I've lived in Australia. The government is not supporting us with a space agency. We do need a space agency. There's no question we need a space agency. But what's happening on the government side is they're waiting for the Australian space industry to come up so they have someone to support. Yeah. Okay, and that's really the big change is now we have you know, these 35 startups and, and if, if you get these startups and the rate that it's going, the rate of growth, then we will have, uh, you know, get these, these startups to be medium-sized businesses, then we'll have uh, a workforce of three to 5,000 people and you know, you know, a billion and a half per year. Uh, export and, and that's something that they could get behind. There's got to be a give yeah. and take. And that's what that's what at Blackbird we're excited about. It's that 35 startups. Of course, not all of them will succeed, but if yeah. we get a small handful of those succeeding, we've got something. We've yeah. built something, mm. and that's super exciting. Um, okay, shout out for questions. If you've got any questions, please um, tweet them. Hashtag the Sunrise 17, um, and ask these guys some questions. Um, okay, I am gonna switch a little bit now and talk about Mars. Yes. I want to hear, I know, you, I know Mars seems a long way away, both in time and in distance and in technology. Tell us how it's going to happen. I think, I know you want to do stuff in Mars. Um, do you? Definitely. Cool. We, um, the way <laughs> I think the next 10 to 15 years is going to go on the moon and on Mars is there will be settlements that are put down there and they're going to want to have resupply. And I think they'll become a very commoditized market for resupplying bases on the moon and on Mars. And it will be price driven. And I think that's something that we want to focus on you know, as we develop our technology 10 years out um, to be delivering supplies to Mars. And that's, I'll give you a, a ballpark of the amount of money I'm talking about. So SpaceX is going to put a Dragon capsule on Mars. They are commercially selling payloads now to be put on the surface at $2 million a kilo. So they're just gonna, they can put 700 kilos on Mars and they're going to give off 100 for $200 million. Now, they said the whole mission is going to cost $300 million. So deliveries to Mars is going to be a very, very profitable business if you can do the technology. So we're definitely going for that. Well, how I see it is that um, nowadays you know, on Earth we feel that we are safe and everything is fine, okay, and um, we are happy and we've got amazing lives, but this is changing, it's going to change. It's going to change for many reasons, okay, because there are billions of people coming on Earth in the coming 10 years, because efficiency, it's, it's not perfect on Earth and there is so much going on, okay. There's going to be a day, and it's going to be not my kids, not their kids, and I'm sorry, not even their kids, so we're not going to say it, when uh, maybe we'll have to get the hell out of here, okay? And it's a long journey. It's most probably going to happen in 100, 200, 300, I don't know, but it's so complicated that technology has to put in, be in place right now. There is so much also we can learn. I mean, there is uh, a lot of people ask me why people invest in space and why in this space mission without clients, okay? Because there is so much to, to invest in Earth to make. The reality is that this is the spirit of humankind. We like to explore and we can't stop it. We know Earth and we know it really well, but there is inside small groups of people and likely we are part of it, okay? That we want to be part of this and we want to innovate and we want to go there and this cannot stop. And in order to get there, people are trying to put infrastructure in place. And you know, Elon Musk, he does a lot for Earth, right? Tesla, and power, efficiency, but he wants to bring people there. And there is people that do asteroid mining, or they do telecommunication in space, you name it, to go to Mars. We have to put this infrastructure in place today. And most of people think you're a massive visionary and crazy if you want to plan something like that. But I think it's time to do it. And technologies are there to do it. I mean, we can go there. Mm. And uh, it needs a bit of justification. And I, I wonder how lower the cost, yeah, if we can actually approach this big, expensive trip in a bit more less expensive way. I think we can. I definitely think we can. Like Gilmore can? Yeah, I mean, I talk cool. to other companies that think the estimates of manned missions to Mars can be cut into 10 or by 100. When does the first man set foot on, or woman, I should say, set foot a Mars. woman, I would say. Woman. When does the first woman set foot on Mars? Maybe uh, 2030. And uh, the reason I say that, I think Elon Musk is going to do it, but he said 2025, and he's normally a little bit late. <laughs> they, late. They, I'm not bagging him out, that happens. But <laughs> I think by 2030, they'll get there. What do you think, Andrea? Yeah, I think Elon might be the first one as well. So yeah. whenever he yeah. gets there. Whenever he gets there. Talking of Elon, we have a, we have a 
question from the audience, which is about SpaceX. And obviously, huge competition from SpaceX. They, you know, really become a dominant player in the launch industry. Adam, what gives you the confidence to build something that is, in in, in some ways, competitive? Not completely competitive, but competitive with SpaceX. Well, we, I, I got a real easy answer. They're looking for massive payloads on every rocket. You know, they're 10,000 kilograms, 12,000 bus-sized satellites, and they've openly said they've missed the small sat market, and they wish they could go back, but they're looking to Mars, and Elon's not going to go back to small sats. So we think there's a very large market that's addressable for small sats that the big guys are not going to focus on. Uh, and that's why that gives us the courage. It's, you know, you can operate in a pretty big space that the big guys aren't looking at right now. And then, you know, the vision is that we use that to springboard ourselves to take them on later. So I met SpaceX the other day and I said, don't worry, I'm a small little launcher. <laughs> and do you know what they said? They said, everybody says that. <laughs> we are worried. Uh, so, OK, let's, um, we're, we're going to finish up um, pretty soon. But I want you guys to each just tell me a little bit about, let's project ourselves 10 years forward. What does the space industry look like in Australia? 10 years. We'll be launching stuff. We'll be launching from Australia. We'll, be, we'll have a launch pad here. Yeah, we'll have a launch pad here. We'll have our own launch vehicle here. We'll have at least three or four satellite companies that are regularly putting stuff into space. Three or four? At least, like big ones, right? When you I know. see 15 unicorns. Okay. 50 that's, unicorns. That's going to happen. We're going to become a full space faring nation. Yep. Is Blackbird going to invest in all the 50 unicorns? I don't know. You have to tell me. All right. Well, what do you think, Jason, Andrea? Uh, if I'm looking 10 years ahead, I'm looking at the interaction between 3D printing and space, uh, which has proven that it, that it works. But once they add 3D printing of electronic components, then you have the ability to 3D print satellites in space. Forget about launching from, uh, from the ground anything but feedstock, right? So you'd be launching like TLA and, and ABS plastic up there. Uh, and then you, um, that's 10 years ahead. And then 15 to 20 years ahead, you're looking at, at the intersection between asteroid mining off Earth resources uh, into the same problem. Now spacecraft are going to cost $3,000 per bird. You're going to start your mission for, you know, you're going to start your own space company for, for less than 20K, OK? That's what's going to happen in, in, in. So this sounds crazy, right? Yeah. To, you know, putting something in space for $3,000 sounds crazy. But let's imagine in 2000, you were talking about setting up a server and a professional website and an e-commerce business for $3,000 or less, which is what you can do right now. Mm -hmm. That would have cost you three or four million dollars. Correct. So really, we're just following that same curve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and VC, that's seen in the business world as well. So it's not just space nerds like us. It's like, you know, the VC investment in space in the last two years alone is the equivalent of the last decade combined. Um, so it's not just, you know, space nerds like us. It's, it, you can see the business case closing on a ton of things. Mm. But we, we, we all talk about going to, to, to Mars and, and, you know, you should go for Mars. Maybe you'll hit the moon, right? But the reality is, is, is the, the commercial effort is going to go to where the money is and, and where the logistics are. Right now we're seeing the growth of, of the human economic zone from the surface of the earth, from, from, from air, now we're seeing, the, the, we're seeing space. Okay, so everything that we've always been talking about, like on, on uh, production of pharmaceuticals, we, we're, we're drugs, you can make the best drugs in space. It's great, you know? Uh, everything up to transportation uh, is, is going to happen, and, and that's really going to be the push over the next 10 to 15 years. Yep. So while, while we're, we've got enough for one question that's popped up on the screen, which is about Rocket Lab. And I, I, I think we should absolutely <laughs> oh. mention Rocket this Lab. Is amazing. For those of you who don't know, Rocket Lab is a New Zealand rocket company. They launched their first rocket last, when, 25th of last May. week. Yeah. Uh, it was a success. It got to space. Um, and so the New Zealanders have a jump on us. But that's a good thing, right? It's great. I don't know. For us, um, I was telling Adam that I love rockets, okay, it's what I've done, where I got my patents, I love it, and uh, I was watching, so I really suggest you to go on YouTube and watch the video, okay, it's just inspiring, it, you feel it, and uh, Peter Beck, this is the CEO, so an entrepreneur journey, okay, he was happy as a kid, and I cried, I have to admit it, online, I cried, because it's amazing, I mean, without Rocket Lab, or without Gilmore, Fleet is not going to make it, it's an enabler, I want to launch 100 satellites in the next three years. So this is, for me, is the future of my company, the future of my vision, the future of 
of everything. And I don't want to talk for you, but this is just proof that what well, you're yeah, doing is I mean, great. We're happy when they succeed because we want to get another round of funding. And if they fail, then we're going to look bad. So, <laughs> I, you know, God bless them. Bob I Peter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to end on a light note. Um, for each of you, how important is Star Wars in the mission to get people to space? Well, uh, He's got to answer first. <laughs> my kids are all named after Jedi Knights. <laughs> <laughs> ben, Obi-Wan Kenobi... Leia and Alana, if you're a real geek, she's Princess Leia's granddaughter in the books Way in the Future and is a mega Jedi Knight, so <laughs> big time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, finally, thank you very much. Um, we are so excited about the future of space. I hope you all understand that, that space is now a startup mm. industry. It's something that startups can do. And you know, at, at Blackbird, we're very, very keen to back the next generation of space entrepreneurs. Congratulations, everyone. And thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.